first of all, thank you very much for, for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here, especially because um, I am not a physicist. I am a historian and philosopher. And um, we tend to look at things differently. And to, to illustrate, um, let me remind you of something that, um, that happened when, um, when Professor Gross spoke on Monday morning. Remember at the end of his talk, uh, when he was asked how that, uh, uh, when he came to know that his theory, that his work was correct, and he said, well, there's knowing, and there's knowing. Remember that? And you laughed, the audience laughed. Well, we philosophers wouldn't laugh, but we take that seriously. We're interested in the difference between knowing and knowing. And in fact, it, and so what I would sort of, one way of putting what I want to talk about is when some future historian uh, comes to look back, say, 100 years from now, tends to, will look back on, on the Yang Mill story, the story of the Yang Mill's theory, what will interest that historian? Well, it, 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 it's a particular episode of the transition between knowing and knowing. So, um, specific, more specifically, the, the phrase Yang Mills, as you all know, can, can refer to two things. The theory proposed, the specific theory that was wrong, proposed uh, on October 1st in the Physical Review uh, of 1954, and, uh, and any non-abelian gauge theory that is something that's not only correct, but the, the foundation, the loom on which modern gauge theory is, um, is woven. So when historians look back on, on this transition, uh, on, on the Yang Mill story, they're going to be interested, I think, in um, how one changed into two. And, um, and there are three specific aspects that I, I want to talk about, just, just sort of outline for you. One is the story of how this tool uh, came together. Um, that is the, uh, you know, historians love a great tangled story about an imp important subject, and, the, uh, and this story has one. Um, you know, it's got, it's got strong characters, it's got a twist complex plot, and, and you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, things were up in the air until the last minute. Um, a second thing is how the physics workplace changed as this tool came together. Um, that is that, that th this, uh, there were dramatic changes in the physics workplace during this time. Um, and how, how, that is, how uh, did what it was like to be a theoretical physicist change as Yang Mills developed, and how much of this change was due to its development? And third, what does the Yang Mills story tell us, if anything, about the nature of theory making, about how knowing uh, becomes knowing? So some discoveries not only contribute to science, but can also tell us about science, and the genesis of Yang Mills, I think, uh, may be one of them. So I'll just say a few words about, about each of them, what a historian's perspective uh, might be. Um, first of all, the tool, uh, the story of how the tool developed. The 1954 version had a famous show-stopping defect in the form of what I think of as the Pauli snag, um, or the requirement that the Lagrangian for non-abelian gauge theory, um, in the Lagrangian for non-abelian gauge theory, the mass term for the gauge field has to be zero. So how was it even possible for, for one to turn into two? Um, how did knowing turn into knowing? This is an interesting uh, uh, story, and this uh, I'll just uh, outline it as a historian might. Um, several key background elements set the stage. Uh, first of all, one is um, Maxwell's formulation of electromagnetism, which was gauge invariant, although the full significance of this in classical theory went unrealized. It was viewed more as a convenient technical feature than a deep principle. Um, another is Einstein's work. Uh, he, with Minkowski, did recognize the gauge invariance of Maxwell's equations and enlarged the concept of invariance. As Professor Yang has, has written in several places, Einstein initiated the principle that symmetry dictates interactions. Uh, Hermann Weyl then tried to relate the, um, the coordinate invariance of gravitation, the gauge invariance of electromagnetism, and the gauge invariance of differential geometry. And in the process, he not only introduced the term gauge, which has stuck ever since, but proposed that it be used as, the, as a principle in the very existence of electromagnetic interactions. Gauge inter invariances to conservation of electric charge, Weil wrote in 1918 as coordinate invariances to con conservation of energy and momentum. Now, Weil and Einstein then had an extended debate on whether Weil's ambitions in this respect were possible, uh, with Einstein arguing that they weren't. This debate was tremendously stimulating and rivals in significance, I think, the, uh, the much more famous debate between Einstein and Bohr over quantum mechanics, uh, about which many books have, uh, have been written. So Weil's idea then made it into Pauli's article. I don't have time to talk about Schrodinger, 
but it made into a uh, Pauli's article on quantum theory in the Handbuch der Physik, published in 1926, and continued to be explored by Pauli into the 1950s. Non-abelian gauge theory was also explored by several others, as O. Ruppertag discusses in his book, The Dawning of Gauge Theory. Uh, now the plot opens. Enter Professor Yang. As a graduate student in the 1940s, he had read Pauli's handbook article, and his attention, as he writes in selected papers, was grabbed by the proposal that ga gauge invariance determined electromagnetic interactions. And he wondered whether the principle of gauge invariance could be moved to new contexts, specifically uh, non-abelian ones, which would allow it to, to, to address strong interactions. As a graduate student, he tried to, ga to generalize gauge invariance by associating it with isotopic spin interactions, fed it led, found that it led to a mess, as he said, and then gave up. Now in 1953, Yang went to Brookhaven for a year, where his office mate was Robert Mills, then in his last year of getting his PhD at Columbia. Now, Professor Yang just told me that, that actually the two had a third office mate, namely Burton Richter, who was in the process, who was in a, gra a graduate student at MIT at the time. Now, theorists with incomplete ideas are like people with songs in their heads that they can't identify. They can't stop trying to place the tune. Um, at Brookhaven, Yang returned to the attempt to place the tune with Mills. The two wondered whether isotopic spin associated with SU2 globe symmetry group, a uh, global symmetry group, might provide a conserved quantity that could be converted to a local gauge symmetry. Just as in electromagnetism, the phase of the wave function can be shifted arbitrarily in space and time because the interaction with the electromagnetic field will cancel out the effects of the alteration. So Yang and Mills propo proposed to do the same for isotopic spin, uh, hypothesizing the existence of a B field to counteract the charge. Just as the raison d'etre of the electromagnetic field is to ensure the symmetry of the electromagnetic interactions with respect to local variations of the wave function phase, so the B field would maintain the gauge symmetry of strong interactions with respect to the orientation of isotopic spin. This, the invariance would determine the interaction. Uh, the invariance would determine the interaction. Yang and Mills finished with what Yang calls the formal aspect of the work in February 1954. Now, our future historian will have read Yang's selected papers and will know the dramatic story of what happened next. At Oppenheimer's invitation, Yang went to Princeton to, pretend to present the work at the Institute for Advanced Study seminar. Who should be present but Pauli, who, was, um, uh, who had been spending the year, uh, at, uh, who was spending the year at, at Princeton, and he'd been working on this, uh, this issue as deeply as anyone but Weil, um, and had identified the show-stopping issue. The future historian will know that this cranky perfectionist interrupted Professor Yang, demanding to know the mass of the field. Yang said he didn't know and resumed the presentation. Pauli cut him off again with the same question, to which Yang responded that he and Mills had looked at the matter but reached no definite conclusions. Pauli remarked that it's not sufficient excuse, and in such a hostile way that Yang, distressed and uncertain, sat down. An awkward silence ensued, with the seminar effectively at a halt. Oppenheimer then said, we should let Frank proceed. He did, but with the rest of the presentation having an awkward flavor in the shadow of Pauli's unanswered and obviously all-important question. Now, Pauli's question was on the money. He was channeling the voice of the quantum field theory of the day, embedded in a particular view of what nature looked like. In the Lagrangian for gauge theories, both abelian and non-abelian, the mass term has to be zero. In the abelian case for QED, this provides our understanding of the zero mass of the photon. But Yang and Mills were out to build a non-abelian uh, theory applicable to hadrons where the gauge particles had to be massive. In the light of the Pauli snag and, and, in, and this view of nature's fundamental units, the ambition just couldn't get off the ground. When Yang turned to Brookhaven, he and Mills decided to publish their work anyway. Why, if it were wrong? Bookmark that question for a moment. I'll return to it in my third section. In their paper, which appeared in Physical Review, later that year they wrestled with the nature of the B quantum in the final section, which Yang wrote was more difficult to, pin to write than all other sections. In regard to its mass, the authors wrote, we do not have a satisfactory answer. Small wonder then that their work was initially regarded as only a mathematical curiosity, as uh, mathematical uh, 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 recreational mathematics, as Tony Z remarked uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, the web of science shows that the paper had only a handful of citations each year for the next few years, 
uh, only one citation in 1957, for instance, uh, only four in 1960. Um, another interesting metric is to look at the number of times that Yang Mills appears in paper titles, uh, some of which may not even cite the work. In fact, several of these don't, don't cite the work at all. According to the Web of Science, this, the first time this happens is, is 1961. You all remember Professor Gross's reference to uh, uh, Wigner's, uh, uh, Wigner describing local symmetry as unnecessary. Well, that's 1964. Um, at this point, the story effectively forks, splitting into two more or less parallel lot, uh, plot lines which recombine only about, 1970, uh, only about 1974, or two decades after the Yang Mills theory first appeared. And this is the really interesting plot development that, that I think is sure to, to fascinate future historians, is the way this plot splits, and then, then they have many subplots and so forth. One thread involves the weak interaction. The uh, uh, key events here include Glashow's 1961 paper, Partial Symmetries of Weak Interactions, which proposed an application of non-abelian gauge theory to the electroweak interaction. Um, and I don't think it actually cites the, the Yang Mills theory, but, but you know, it's obviously in there. He, too, encountered the Pauli snag, called it the principal stumbling block in any pursuit of the analogy between hypothetical vector mesons and photons, but boldly said it is a stumbling block that we must overlook. He also encountered the issue that the theory might not be renormalizable. Six years later, Steven Weinberg, again in another paper that doesn't uh, cite uh, Yang Mills, um, published explicitly, published a model of leptons. Weinberg had been trying to make a Yang Mills theory for various mesons unsuccessfully. Then, one day, while driving to his office at MIT, he suddenly realized that he might have been applying the right idea to the wrong problem. Why not use the Yang Mills mathematical apparatus for, apparatus for weak interactions and intermediate vector bosons, employing spontaneously symmetry breaking to give the car, uh, gauge particles mass? Now, spontaneous symmetry breaking has its own plot proposed in 1964 by Angler and Brout, by Higgs, by Hagen, Goralnik, and Kibble, and, as the plots, and, um, and its plot suggested the existence of a yet unseen massive and spinless Higgs boson, which was discovered experimentally, of course, only uh, almost a half century later. Weinberg brought these two plot lines together. We do not usually expect non-abelian gauge theories to be renormalizable if the vector ma meson mass is not zero, he writes in the paper. But here, the meson in, mesons in question, quote, get their mass from the spontaneous breaking of their symmetry, not from a mass term put in at the beginning. But whether the theory was, in fact, renormalizable was not clear. And as a result, the paper was hardly cited for several years. Salam, who had followed his own particular path in yet another plot line, wrote a similar proposal about the same time. Three years later, another key step was taken when Glashow, Iliopoulos, and Mayani, in what would soon be called the gym mechanism, realized that adding an, an, an additional quark, bringing the total of quarks and leptons to four each, would solve many phenomenological and theoretical problems, reducing the divergences and eliminating neutral currents. In the first version of the paper, the paper they submitted to, um, to the uh, uh, to the reviewers, they proclaimed that this theory might be renormalizable, and that claim was slapped down by a physical review referee. The authors then toned down their claim to the softer statement that a Yang Mills theory, quote, does not make the theory more divergent. This claim was just as unsupported as the original claim, but the physical, it satisfied the reviewer of the physical review now accepted the paper, which was published in October 1970. Um, the success of these attempts hung on their renormalizability. This path had been worked on by Fadiev and Popov and others, still more subplots, um, and, but finally answered in, uh, they, these, uh, uh, th this was finally answered in a dramatic fashion at a conference in Amsterdam in August 1971, um, when Veltman, introducing the work of Tuft, declared that it made the theory every bit as good as quantum electrodynamics. A non-abelian gauge theory is renormalizable, Tuft showed, if and only if the mass term comes from spontaneous symmetry breaking. But Tuft's proofs, written in the language of Feynman diagrams, were difficult to understand. Also, was the proposed theory true? Experimentally, confirmation came shortly uh, in um, 1954 uh, from multiply uh, confirmed observations of weak neutral currents. Um, theoretically, then, Ben Lee recast Tuft's work in the language of path integrals uh, which many found easier to understand and easier to generalize. Now, in this weak interaction subplot, therefore, 
you know, this is what makes it so much, will make it so much fun to the future historian. Spontaneous symmetry breaking was the, was the answer to the Pauli snag. With spontaneous symmetry breaking, you have a different world, one with more than one vacuum, where the Hamiltonian is invariant, but the ground state is not. The world addressed by the new theory was a different one from the world towards which Pauli was addressing his remark. Now, the strong interaction subplot was also tortured. Professor Gross has recapped this story on Monday, so I don't need to do so. In this territory, gauge theory had long seemed implausible um, until 1968. Um, that is, when the results of uh, deep inelastic scattering, um, uh, uh, electron-proton scattering at slack appeared to be uh, describable in terms of scattering off point-like particles. So quarks were behaving not as mere mathematical entities, but as if they played dynamical roles, free particles at short distances. This provoked theorists then to look for a field theory that acted counter to the ones that were already known, in which the coupling gets weaker at short distances. After a dramatic scramble in which many theorists found key pieces, made close encounters, even more sub subplots, um, such, as, uh, such an asymptotically free theory was found with proofs by Glo Gross and Wilczek and by Pulitzer published back to back in the Physical Review Letters issue of November 15, 1973. Um, so here too the Pauli snag was overcome and, in, and also in a bizarre way. A local non-abelian gauge theory turns out not to apply to the same conserved quantities as isospin does, but to a different world. Pelly's question was about things that today we'd call quarks and gluons. But the work in quantum chromodynamics showed that the relevant physical states are not quarks and gluons, but color singlets. So a non-abelian gauge theory of the sort Yang and Mills were aiming to construct turned out to, to apply to entities different from the neutrons and protons and pions that had inspired their effort. Now, as a, a, an historian knows, too, that a, that a uh, breakthrough doesn't necessarily become universally acknowledged and even accepted at its publication, its spread can be hindered by complicated mathematics and techniques that are difficult to generalize. Two key developments then ensure the spread of the theory, the work of Ken Wilson in 1974, which provided a non-perturbative formulation of gauge theory, making it easier to work with, as Mike Kreutz told us yesterday, and a further extension by Kreutz himself in 1979. So this, then, is a sketch of what a historian of a century uh, uh, from now, I think, will see as the rough plot outline of the way Yang Mills went from one to two, from a mathematical curiosity known not to apply to the world to uh, an indispensable tool of theoretical physics that does. It's complicated. What's fascinating is that it has two main subplots, each with tangled sub-subplots and many more figures and contributions that I've mentioned. Also fascinating is that the Pauli snag is resolved differently in each of these, uh, th these plot lines, with the solution being that the world turns out to be different from the one about which Paul, uh, Pauli thought that he was asking. But the end result was the creation of the loom on which modern gauge field theory is woven. And th the most remarkable aspect of this story, to paraphrase O'Reffertag, is not that it took so much time, but that it came together at all. So that's the remarkable story of how the tool developed, uh, which I said was the first aspect that'll, that'll interest the historian of 100 years uh, 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 from now. Uh, but historians are interested not just in the tools, but in the workplace in which these tools are developed. So another aspect will be the dramatic change in the workplace um, in, in, in the, the period of this story. How did what it was like to be a physicist change during the period in which Yang and Mills theories developed? and how much of that was due to their development. Um, and I think we've seen much of the answer uh, in the first two days of this, this conference, and it sort of helps me figure out what, uh, what's going on. Um, the early 1950s was the beginning of a new period for, uh, for physics, as Professor Yang himself told us. Um, the first accelerators to surpass one GeV were coming online. No longer would experimenters have to climb mountains to hunt cosmic rays and strange particles. Um, but they could now create them con uh, conveniently and copiously in the secure safety of the laboratory. So the first of these was the, the Cosmotron um, at Brookhaven, but Berkeley's Bevatron was not far behind, and then other uh, accelerators over 1 GeV at, um, at Argonne, Birmingham, Dubna. Um, and then, within the next few years, a second generation based on uh, all the alternate gradient all the alternating gradient focusing. So the experimental workplace in particle physics was suddenly exciting. The enthusiasm was on display 
Um, if I could just tell this little story, at the Cosmotron's dedication ceremony in December 1952. The machine, um, this machine had cost a whopping $8.7 million um, and was already running at its design energy of 3 GeV. At the ceremony, one waggish physicist had put up a sign saying, this side up on the top of this 2,200 ton machine. Not everyone was interested, it was uh, in on the levity though, a journalist uh, sidled up to theorist Robert Serber and asked, when does it move? The, the celebratory atmosphere culminated at dinner that evening in the Cosmotron building. Pictures of chilled martinis on each table encouraged behavior to loosen, voices to grow loud, and things to get boisterous. Louis Alvarez, a 41-year-old Berkeley physicist 16 years away from his Nobel Prize, set his tablecloth on fire. A representative from Wellesley passed out on the table. The keynote speaker, Detlef Bronk, who was the president of Johns Hopkins University, mixed up the text of his speech with one he was scheduled to give in Canada a few, years, a few days later, puzzling the Americans in the audience who were still able to pay attention with references to your king. <laughs> with, with experimenters at these facilities discovering every, uh, ever more particles, the early 1950s was also a thrilling time for theorists. What sense did it all make? What schemes could be devised to organize a particle equivalent of a periodic table? It was unclear which properties were the most important. Um, as as O'Refferteg puts it, it was a time of educated theoretical guesses. One notable feature of the theoretical workplace in the early 1950s was the segmentation of its theorists into different ethnicities, with those who worked on strong, weak, and electromagnetic interactions using different tools and speaking different mathematical languages. Electromagnetism had quantum electrodynamics, which stemmed from the Dirac equation, an equation that Frank Wilczek has called achingly beautiful. QED is a theory showing that particles of light, which we now call photons, arise naturally if you apply quantum mechanics to electromagnetism. The hope of quantum field theory was that you could treat other particles, such as electrons and protons, as quanta of generalizations of the electric field, shifting the basic structure of the, uh, of the theoretical framework from particles and waves to fields. QED, of course, includes the electron field as well as the photon field. But while quantum electrodynamics scored a series of stunning successes in the first few years, by the 1950s, many people regarded it as having lost its beauty. The wrinkles that spoiled the beauty were divergences that required using ad hoc procedures and introducing things by hand. Dirac himself came to call the theory ugly. The theory didn't flow from a single vision, he declared, in the way of truly beautiful things, but seemed stitched together in a way that made it seem fundamentally incomplete. Even though quantum field theory had some stunning successes, most notably its, uh, its ability to predict with extraordinary accuracy the uh, lamp shift and electro, electron anomalous and magnetic moment, the price one, ha one had to pay was having to, as Dirac said, abandon logical deduction and replace it by working rules. This is a very heavy price, he said, and no physicist should be content to pay it. Landau, we heard, was a particular skeptic. So was Oppenheimer. Throughout the 1950s, um, Oppenheimer struggled to maintain his disbelief in QED, as uh, Robert Serber recalled. It had become a difficult language to use, with many people certain it could not address all contemporary problems. It didn't seem to apply to the quant strong interaction, which seemed amenable to other languages, such as S-matrix theory. And while a universal Fermi interaction had been proposed, it was not completely clear, even as late as 1956, that there even was one. So at the, at the beginning of the development of Yang-Mills theory, therefore, the experimental workplace was hopping, and the theoretical workshop was a kind of babble. At the other end, just 20 years after the Yang-Mills paper, the structural environment had changed. Yang-Mills theory had established field theory as the dominant theoretical language and unified the mathematical babble. It also seemed to have had longer-term structural effects. For its development made possible the beginning of the era when you were confident that looking at constraints at low energies could allow you to make predictions at extremely high energies. So now the current form of, the, of such a theory is the standard model, as we all know, of uh, electroweak and strong interactions. Um, so there has been a successful extrapolation of two to three orders of magnitude in energy, which is a, rem a remarkable achievement. Um, there are hopes of finding ways to complete the model, which has given rise to it, to, to extend the model, which has given rise to a new industry called uh, beyond the standard model physics, 
Many of these schemes, as we've heard, involve generalizations of yang mills theory along with string theory. Um, string theory started out from the old S matrix theory, but by now has strong kinship with quantum field theory. So over time, the landscape of high energy or short distance physics has been dramatically, ah, am I running out of time? Five minutes, I can do this in five minutes. Uh, has been reshaped, um, so the workplace, uh, it did affect the workplace, large changes took place. But let me just mention the third aspect uh, of the transition from one to two, one that's interesting to philosophers. What does it mean, uh, the transition between knowing and knowing? Um, that aspect has to do with the paradox. Pauli, as, as I said, was not wrong. The theory proposed by Yang and Mills in 1954 did not and could not apply to the world. So in terms of conventional notions, uh, the ones that we play lip service to, that a theory is a hypothesis to be tested against the world and either to be added to the store of knowledge or rejected, the yang Mills work was a non-starter. How is it possible for such a clearly incorrect proposal to become such a seminal event in the history of physics? To put it crudely, how could a theory be not, not yet true of the world? The fact that this can happen shows that something's wrong with this conventional view of, uh, of the, the nature of theory. Um, and I, I was going to sort of um, explain by referring to an anal now analogous um, episode in, uh, from discover uh, from, um, concerning discovery, concerning the discovery of oxygen. You know, who's the discoverer of oxygen? Was it Sheila Priestley or Lavoisier? Sheila collected the gas but didn't know what it was, talked about it in conventional terms. Uh, Priestley uh, also collected the gas from red precipitate, heating red precipitate of mer mercury. Um, but described it confusedly and, and uh, uh, I'm, no, I'm sorry, Sheila collected it but didn't publish until after. Uh, Priestley collected it but described it in obsolete terms and Lavoisier then was able to describe it but only because his assumptions about what nature was like had begun to change in the form of the combustion theory, of the, of the combustion theory that burning bodies absorb something that's pure in a component of air uh, and Priestley's confusion contributed to that realization. So the discovery of oxygen didn't play, take place at a moment. It didn't have one uh, discoverer, but it was protracted. The world had to change in order for oxygen to be, uh, uh, to be discovered, and it took a while. And it took a, a long period, an awareness of confusions, a uh, willingness not to accept the inherited uh, understanding, but to respond in a new way, uh, all adding up to a change in the world that had to take place in order to recognize what oxygen was. So um, discovery is sometimes not just adding something new to the world, but involves reinterpreting the world in a way that allows something to be seen for the first time. Now the Yang Mill story, I think, contains a similar lesson about theory, and that was ma what makes it really interesting to our future historians and philosophers. When did the transition from one to two, from, um, from a theory that doesn't fit the world to one that does, take place? It can't, we can't pin it down, I think, to any specific date between 1954 and, say, 1975. It required a shift in our ideas about the world addressed by the theory, a shift that was gradual and to which the Yang Mills proposal itself contributed and even made possible. Then this doesn't fit the conventional lip service uh, hypothesis confirmation view. Um, so the, the, the story, the story of Yang Mills points to a deeper understanding of theory making in which the world sometimes has to be reinterpreted so that a theory can fit it. Not only that, but the really interesting issue which I think makes this episode even more suggestive than the one involving oxygen, is that the Yang Mills proposal preceded that reinterpretation. It was a proposal that helped to set in motion a change in the interpretation of the world in a way that would make it applicable, uh, this theory applicable to the world. Um, this raises an interesting question. What could possibly have made Yang and Mills confident enough so that they published it in the face of the vociferous criticism of the Emin and Pauli, channeling the venerable spirit of quantum electrodynamics? The fact that they were that confident suggests that theory making is not always a matter of seeking something provable and applicable to the world, but sometimes at least of articulating a sense of the world that has not yet fully taken shape. In at least some cases, theory making involves summarizing and organizing some pre-existing sense of the world that's not explicitly stated uh, uh, before any proof or evidence. The 1954 Yang Mills theory laid out what would make, make it possible for the resources of quantum field theory to apply. That was the important point, not whether it was confirmed or not. Um, and then it, that is the theory, helped realize that possibility. So the Yang Mills theory, I think, thus points to a way to revise conventional notions, the, the ones to which we paid lip service to about theory making. 
Um, it points out the way, I think, to talk about the difference between knowing and knowing. So to conclude, the, um, the uh, historians and philosophers of the future, I think, will continue to be fascinated by the Yang Mills theory, and for these three aspects, how it involved in, as a tool, how it helped transform the theoretical workplace, and how it helps us rethink the nature of theory making. Thank you. <laughs> how do I do? Well, two, <coughs> two comments. One is about history. I think that we missed the name of Vladimir Fock, who was first to introduce phase transformation, not scale transformation of way, but phase transformation. It's a paper of 26, and in Russian literature, it was called, gauge transformation was called gradient transformation for a long time. And second thing, you did not, uh, in your arguing, I think you missed mentioning mathematical intuition. Yesterday I said about it, and clearly here, example of arisal of young Mills is kind of victory of mathematical intuition. Um, again, what do you mean by mathematical intuition? Oh. Well, you, several times you said it was kind of wrong theory and so on. It, but. The, it was beautiful and somehow showed that it's, wrong, uh, it's true because it was conceived as mathematical example. Yeah. I, I think mathematical intuition just means what it says. Mathematical intuition. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, as I said, this is, this is a short version of a much longer story, but, it, but this, this co complicated plot line in which all these subplots occur and focus certainly one of them in mathematical intuition or another are, are part of it. Yeah, can I? Uh, I also want to point out, you know, that in 1938, Oscar Klein ha had the idea, and there is in. You talked in a conference in um, in Poland, in uh, and he had the idea that he he would use his technique, what we call the Kaluza Klein. He was starting in a five-dimensional theory, but he, he didn't want to just make it into U1. He wanted to have an SU2, and he wrote down a theory. You know also for protons and neutrons. It was, not, it was not right, you know. I mean, it didn't have exactly the, the, the young Mills theory. Uh, but um, he had the idea that it should be an SU2 theory. And um, this was just before the war, and this was a co at a conference. And it was, the proceedings is published, and one can read about it. Uh, but of course, it was completely forgotten after that. Did you ever, when did you hear about it first time, Klein work? I heard about it for the first time after it was discussed, I think by Cecilia Yoskog or someplace, and then I looked it up. In fact, I think uh, sometime in the 1980s, I was invited to give a uh, Oscar Klein a lecture in uh, Copenhagen, and I refer to that. Uh, I think it's very interesting that uh, Klein had uh, tried to do something, but what uh, was missing, a crucial missing point in his ideas, was the lack of the concept of gauge invariance. Uh, well, without that, it becomes a sort of a juggling without a principle. I think uh, I've been uh, repeatedly reflected, uh, asked, uh, why did uh, I work on this uh, gauge theory? I think the reason is very simple, and I think that is uh, why uh, I was able to uh, do something very useful. And that is uh, early on, I uh, said to myself, with all these elementary, new elementary particles, there should be a principle for the interaction. N not just uh, write down scalar coupling with uh, scalar mesons, scalar coupling with vector mesons, etc., etc. And there were books and books uh, about that. Uh, I thought we must find a principle. And uh, the only principle that uh, we knew at the time was the gauge principle.
So that's uh, the origin of uh, my effort. But as you all know, uh, that uh, met with uh, the formidable police <laughs> disapproval. Mm. Uh, however, Mirza and I decided it's too beautiful. And uh, so we decided to publish it. Fortunately for us, in those days, the editors were not so choosy. So <laughs> they just. <laughs> Uh, Lars, I'd like to add that David Gross has written a very nice article yeah, about yeah. what Klein meant. Yeah, so you can read about it. So David Gross wrote about Oscar Klein's work, you know, and he, uh, that was from this conference in 1938. Uh, so it's published somewhere. But then <clears throat> I was also thinking when you were talking about, you know, in the, of course, in the 50s, the, the people talked about the ideas, and Schwinger had, you know, at some stage, and in the V minus A paper by Feynman and Gaman, which is essentially two papers put together, and in the second part, which is the one where Gaman talks about it, he is, is putting forward the, 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 the idea that it could be a vector particle. So if, if one reads it very carefully, you can see that he, he, was, he had your idea in the back of his mind, but of course he didn't really dare to, to write it down in formula, but he, he puts it in. There, there, mm. There's a sentence about that. So, so the good people were taking your ideas seriously. But my, my last comment was also that when you were talking about Weinberg's paper, it, it's, it's very interesting that it was preceded by a Solvay conference in 1967. I don't know if you were there or, you know, one of these big conferences. And there, um, Weinberg was saying, he was pr proposing it, but he was saying it's not renormalizable, he said, unfortunately. And Anglair, who was there, who had written a, a paper the year before, um, where he had shown that, you know, the, the um, spontaneously broken young mills theory should have the same renormalization properties as the, 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 uh, the uh, pure young mills, because the, you can see that the propagator uh, in the case of when it's spontaneously broken, has the same uh, properties when you go to in P equals to infinity. And then uh, Weinberg says in, in the discussion, he says, one of us is wrong. And in fact, he was the one to, to be wrong there. And Anglais was the one to, to be right. So that was, but the belief that it, it, it was not really not, not renormalized, but must have been very strong in the 60s. Uh, yeah. uh, I don't remember that I ever, Sorry? after 1954, was invited by any university uh, to speak about gauge theory. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, as far as I remembered, the first time that uh, somebody showed some interest was uh, uh, Uchiyama. Mm -hmm. uh, Uchiyama in 1956 uh, published a paper. Mm -hmm. uh, he was trying to link gravity with uh, gauge theory. Uh, that is a very difficult topic which we still have not uh, resolved. Uh, but at least uh, he was paying attention uh, to non billing gauge theory. Uh, the next uh, person who seems, as far as uh, I remembered, to show some interest was uh, Murray German. I think in 1958 or 59, he published a paper with uh, Levy, uh, Maurice Levy. And uh, they generalized it to, uh, I think it was SU3 or something like that. Yeah. And also there was a Russian. There was uh, Ivanenko or somebody. There was a Russian theorist who published a small book, which was a collection of translations of uh, gauge theories from English uh, uh, to Russian. And uh, I have a copy, he, he sent me a copy, so there was a little book. I think that little book was published in the early 1960s. 
Uh, why Weinberg in 1967 or 68 uh, had speculated that the non-abelian gauge theory was renormalized over? I do not know. I did not have contact with Weinberg. So I did not know uh, why uh, he thought so. But the fact was, in the late 1960s, uh, there was a postdoc at Stonebrook uh, named Lee. Uh, he has disappeared in physics. Uh, but anyway, he and I were trying to find the Feynman diagrams for non-abelian gauge theory at the same time that uh, Feynman was trying to do it. And uh, we got into a, uh, what uh, uh, we did, oh, not his name was, his name is Wang, Wang Xiangjiang. What we did was we added a mass term to the gauge particle and then approached the limit that the m go to zero. Uh, that was also what uh, Feynman was doing. And we both got into the same problem, namely eventually uh, there was a fact of two, which was very peculiar. And uh, I got <laughs> uh, frustrated with that. And in the meantime, I was uh, making progress in uh, statistical mechanics. So I abandoned that and w uh, went into statistical mechanics. Feynman did not abandon it. And he suggested something like uh, the ghost. But as far as I am concerned, he did not pursue it. It was, uh, uh, I think he had a few sentences which he hinted uh, in his report in, uh, uh, in Poland. Uh, to me, uh, the great achievement was that of uh, Father F. And if you look at the, the papers by uh, Tohuf and the Bergman, it was all full of uh, quotations from him. So that's uh, my memory. But of course, uh, for a thing which is uh, sort of as complicated as this, I think everybody has his own memory of uh, what the true story was. Yeah, I'd like to uh, ask Bob, the historian, about two historical incidents. Uh, one is the 1964 encounter between Goranik and Ward, and the other is the Weinberg student making a sign error in 1967-68, which led Weinberg to believe that it's non renormalizable Sorry? Weinberg student? Uh, Weinberg, uh, according to the, this is probably an exaggeration, because Weinberg, as Lars remarked, I uh, had to admit that he was wrong. And so he apparently uh, made sure the student did not get a job. So he disappeared from physics. So maybe he didn't write a letter of recommendation or something. Like that. So I don't know the student's name. But the student was told by Weinberg to calculate neutrino neutrino scattering. And the student made, there are two diagrams, and the student made a sign error. The, the, the two diagrams should cancel. But instead, it, uh, he told Weinberg that the error was worse, uh, the divergence was worse than. But most of us actually at the time reacted to the story by feeling that Weinberg should have checked the student's calculation. If he didn't check the calculation, that was his mistake. Sorry? Lenam Chan. That's Lenam Chan? Yeah, he was a student. He was a student. Oh, okay. <coughs> well, it's Nip Nipong Chen is here. <laughs> Nipong is here, maybe he's here. <laughs> Hello? No. no. But the uh, Guraunik versus uh, encounter with Ward is also very interesting. It's documented in close, Frank Close's book. I wonder if you want Mr. to uh, Chairman. No, say what I, Mr. I, as, a, as a historian, I, I, I've heard of those, but I, I really need to look into those to, to be able to say anything definitive on it. Mr. Chairman. Okay, they're very short. Yeah, it's very short. It's very important, in fact. <laughs> I... I work on history and philosophy of science. What happened is that, like the uh, Professor Greece here, they are outsiders. It's very really hard for them to understand how physics actually work. I mean, the discovery. So my suggestion is that those sitting here and outside of here, physics, when you have time, 
write some short articles, explain what you are doing, why you are doing that, you know, publish it or put it there that, to help them, to help them. And for the philosopher, historians, like Professor Greece, he should interview the person involved before he gives this, 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 this talk. Yes, yes, yes. Right? I agree totally. Yeah. And, <laughs> and sometimes even so-called insiders, like Thomas Kuhn, he got a PhD physics in physics from Harvard, and he got everything wrong. So there's two possibilities. Either Harvard is not very good in training the physics PhDs, <laughs> or Tom actually is very stupid. Thank you much. Uh, let me just say, let me just say one comment. Yes, I agree with you. But in fact, I did interview most of the people involved, including Mills, um, in, in, that I spoke about. Did you interview all the Yes, I did. Okay. No, no, no. Because I have to clear my brother's you have name. To defend. I, don't I have to clear my yourself. brother's name. Otherwise, yeah. I'm not a good brother. <laughs> It was not him. It was yes. I don't think it was him. It was not him. It was not him. No, no. Wait, 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 wait. Oh no, no, no. no. <laughs> it was not him. It was somebody else, and I met that somebody else at Max Planck Institute. I, but I forgot his name. <laughs> okay, it's not Lei Nam Chen. Okay, then the next time to speak. Thank you.